On BBC Two Now, a retrospective. After 10 years of trying to help the homeless, campaign director Sheila McKechnie bows out with a last bid for shelter. <laughs> After 10 years as the director of Shelter, the national campaign for homeless people, Sheila McKechnie is moving on. But everything she packs is a reminder of her unceasing struggle with successive governments over their failure to tackle Britain's housing crisis. These are the real record of that failure. Ordinary people whose lives have been damaged and sometimes destroyed because they've got no home of their own. Shelter has fought for these people ever since it was set up in 1966 amid the wave of outrage surrounding the BBC film Cathy Come Home. For the last 10 years I've done everything I can through campaigns, in the papers, on radio and television to keep homelessness in the public eye. So why do we still have cardboard cities and soup runs and figures huddled in sleeping bags? These problems are the result of a housing system that's gone badly wrong. We haven't been committed to a housing policy that makes sure that every citizen has a decent home. We've had a lot of political dogma that has pushed more and more people into owner occupation. And the right to buy was hailed as the most successful policy of the decade. It's all here in my diaries. September 1986. Mrs Thatcher has celebrated the sale of the millionth council house with the new owners at Forres in Grampian. Her exclusive housewarming gift was a bottle of Prime Minister's Special Reserve whisky. She told them the government wants more people to buy their council homes. But outside she was met by a group who told her the policy meant fewer houses for the homeless. Many of our homelessness problems today have been caused by the right to buy council houses policy, largely because the Treasury stopped the councils from using the money to improve housing. In the last 10 years, I have seen growing numbers of young people on the streets, many of them straight out of council care. We have tens of thousands of families living in temporary accommodation. Over a third of a million homes have been repossessed since 1985 and thousands more are in the pipeline. The push into owner occupation was always going to end in tears for many people. When our magazine Roof warned the government about the impending crisis of repossessions, we were accused of scaremongering. Sadly, we were right. The number of homes repossessed by building societies and banks has reached an all-time high. In the first six months of this year, 14,390 homes were lost because people could not keep up with their mortgage payments more than for the whole of last year. And a record 76,000 people are now six to 12 months in arrears. Trevor Orman didn't want to buy a house. But with rented property in short supply, the couple were encouraged to buy. So the Almonds proudly took possession of a one-up, one-down starter home. Okay, you ready then, love? You fit? Let's go. Come on, Come on darling. Off you go. Everything went well for a while, but Trevor was made redundant from the garage where he worked, at the same time as 20,000 other redundancies at the nearby British Aerospace Works in Hertfordshire he set up as a self-employed mechanic. Things were actually looking quite good, so at the beginning of 1994, I actually rented a unit. Um, by this time, we had another child, and we were desperately overcrowded in this house. Self-employment started quite well with the unit, and for two months, we did 
very nicely and then the work tailed off a little bit and expenses increased so I start, I was unable to pay the mortgage. Um, I didn't immediately go to the state for assistance, I wanted to hold my head up and try um, and I thought if things improved later on in the year, as, as well they might, that I'd be able to pay off the deficit but this was not to be so I decided to close the business. By this time the building society had instigated repossession proceedings and uh, we have at this point in time actually been repossessed and are waiting to move out depending on what the council will offer us. As mortgage arrears and repossessions mounted into tens of thousands, John Major used an unlikely platform to offer hope to desperate families. Well, we stopped, if you will recall, at the repossessions just before Christmas. We took action which should stop most of the repossessions. There will always be some. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. For the Almonds and many other families, it was cruel delusion. I looked into the mortgage rescue schemes. Um, the building society told me that I had to have £6,500 saved up to pay all the one-off fees and that I would need to be earning about £23,000 a year to warrant a mortgage on a sensible house with the negative equity transferred. And I've never earned that kind of money in my life. I'd like to. I'm sure if I did, I wouldn't have a problem anyway. The Almonds should have been more careful, of course. They made the silly mistake of trusting the government, the estate agents and the building societies who were advising them. Now they've lost everything. One view in government now is that the individuals are fully informed, rational, and can make all the kind of right decisions for themselves. Well, up to a point that's true, but if you look through the 1980s, the government had numerous campaigns, uh, advertising and persuasion, if you like, uh, getting people into home ownership. There certainly was a view to which I think government contributed that you couldn't fail if you became a homeowner. And I think that uh, people are right to feel angry at government for what's happened to them in the last four years. Angry? They've used stronger words than that to me when they've lost their homes. And my view that people weren't just being gently encouraged into buying houses is supported by one of the seven wise men who advised the government on economic policy. People have had a, a stick as well as a carrot, which has encouraged them in that direction. The stick has been that the rented sector hasn't really, in general, been very attractive. The fact that people did feel the need to get on the housing ladder because we didn't have an adequate alternative in terms of a strong private rented sector uh, amplified the, the swings in the economy and therefore made the, the, the boom that much more intense and has intensified the pain that people are feeling uh, as a result of the recession. I think that essentially uh, housing uh, policy uh, has wasted resources. Uh, it has uh, seen significant amounts of subsidy go to households that didn't need it. Uh, that's pushed up prices. Uh, in consequence of that, there have been significant instabilities in the housing market so that uh, management of the economy has become much more difficult. Uh, house prices, in a sense, fueled the boom and then prolonged the bust period very significantly indeed. The professor was pretty thorough there, but I should also point out that we must build at least 100,000 affordable new homes a year just to keep up with need, whether they're built by councils or housing associations. In the last 10 years, we've rarely even hit half that target. The government's idea was that housing associations would accommodate everyone who couldn't afford to buy. But if you don't build enough houses and rents double over a five-year period, you're only making a bad situation worse. The consequences of government housing policy are particularly dire in the country villages and on the fringes of our major towns and cities. All the more desirable property has now been bought up, and in some cases, one-time council houses are now second homes for the affluent. 
The growing number of homeless people in the countryside crowd in with friends and relatives, and we don't see them. So many of the images on our television screens are of homeless people in London that we have to run advertising campaigns to remind people that homelessness afflicts every part of Britain. The best urban housing has gone too, of course, leaving little more than run-down estates with a reputation for crime, vandalism and fear. I don't want anybody to forget Lord Scarman's report on the Brixton riots, in which he identified bad housing as one of the root causes of social unrest. To get a house, you need money or priority on a housing list. Young people rarely have either but I've seen them repeatedly singled out for harsh treatment by successive governments. One of the major effects of this mean-spirited policy shift was to take away the right of most 16 and 17-year-olds to any benefits at all. The result? Fairly predictable. More homeless students. And, just to make sure of that, if the policy had been to make more young people homeless, it could not have worked better. The reason they're there now is a whole series of benefit changes. People decided to take the measures that put people on the streets. The truth is, for most of the young people on the streets, it's the constantly frightening, degrading, dirty, unhappy experience. When I'm begging, a lot of the public, like, they give abuse, they'll go home and things like that, but that, like, they don't understand why, why you're not at home. If they, underst like, if they knew why you wasn't at home, then maybe they'd like, have a different attitude towards homeless people. Let them help us, you know what I mean? I'd, I'd be glad to get a job and go away and have a new life, but I can't because I've no experience. I lived everywhere with foster parents, adopted parents, children's homes. I've been in 28 foster parents, 18 children's homes, and I ran away with a travellers for two years, and then I came to London. Spare some change, please. The government can't get off the hook. There is no need for young people to be on the streets, there's no need for them to be begging, we know what to do about it and we know what will work. But we will never be a whole society at ease with itself if our rejects, if the young people, if the mentally ill are constantly there on the streets as a reminder of our failure. Youth charities like Centrepoint have been working with young homeless people for 25 years. As the numbers hitting the streets have multiplied, they've had to grow with them, opening shelters and hostels across the capital. The most out frustrating thing about the young people we see here is like, what a waste, what a waste of energy and potential and optimism, all those things that young people have. And it's a question for us as a society and for the politicians and the officials to make their minds up about, are we happy with so many people living like that or are we gonna do something about it? It's in our power to solve. And I think the great thing you did at shelter, which you never let them forget that. The 9th of April, 1990. I remember I flew to Paris that evening. That's when I discovered the French foyer system. And it seemed a very obvious answer to the no home, no job, no job, no home syndrome. When young people first encounter a foyer, they are often astonished. They have grown so used to being treated as worthless that the simple fact of offering them a decent home at a rent they can afford 
and practical training in the same building does much to restore their self-respect. I'm glad to say that over 22 foyers have been established here since I went to France, and there are at least 20 more in the pipeline. Foyers prove what has always been obvious to me, that young people respond well if you only give them the chance. It has to be a more successful policy in anybody's terms than throwing the future of our nation out onto the streets. Um, yeah. If you look around you on the streets of Britain today, you'll see that anybody can be homeless. So along with vulnerable young men and women, you'll see black people. They have a particularly hard time. The mentally and physically ill, and men and women who surely deserve better as they grow old. Five years and Yeah, well, I would have. I would have been down on St. Thomas Hugh. It's just money people again, messing it up for lads. They just know what all you can do. I mean, when I lived down here, they came down spraying the pavements yeah, yeah. with the hoses. Well, they don't do that anymore, they stop that. They don't that. do that, they stop oh. it. You, know. they, you get moved on by, by the police. I mean, they're entitled to move you on because you're sleeping in people's shop doorways. But then you've got to find somewhere else to sleep. You don't know if you're going to get picked on, you know, kicked about, um, urinated on. You don't know if it's going to pour down the rain, you're going to get soaking wet, or if it's going to snow. Um, and you're scared that you're not going to wake up, that you'll freeze to death. Sometimes I've been uh, sleeping in shop doorways and gone to wake somebody when there's a tea, tea wagon or a clothing wagon around, and gone to wake them and um, they've died, you know, of, of the cold or of overdose or of drink, you know. I've seen rough sleeping get even rougher over the last 10 years since places like Lincoln's Inn Fields in London, used by homeless people for over a century, have been fenced off following legal action against Camden Council. I think it's part of a pattern. Have you noticed a new and to my mind sinister trend in architecture recently? These premises clearly extend a warm Christmas welcome to homeless people. It makes me sick. There are sections of our society who simply want homeless people to go away. A couple of years ago, some traders decided that the growing number of homeless people on the Strand in London were bad for business and threatened to hose them down. They were talking about young people like there was so much litter on the street just to be swept up out of sight. I don't think I've ever been as angry in my life they met over there. All the hoteliers from this street met in the Savoy. And they were going to bring a sweeper out at night and spray them. I think if they had done it, we would have picketed every hotel in this street. Defending the cause of rough sleepers is only one part of Shelter's work. There are huge numbers living in temporary and often squalid accommodation who are less obvious because we don't see them in our daily lives, or at least we don't recognise that they're homeless. So we've needed to use the media wherever we can to make sure they don't get forgotten. We've got some useful coverage over the years and one of my very good contacts is now an investigative journalist on the Mail on Sunday. But when I first knew him, he was a staff reporter on Shelter's campaigning magazine, Roof. Nick, one of the very first memories I have when I came to Shelter in April 85 was you storming into my office saying, look at this, look at this, have you ever seen anything like it? What are you going to do about it? Do you remember them? Yeah, I remember them very well. I mean, not least because it was probably the, the worst building I've ever been into in my life. The Spencer Hotel was about 50 yards from Camden Town Hall, and yet um, it had the most appalling conditions I've ever seen. The roof was off, part of it. There were about 30 or 40 men living there in extreme squalor. Uh, we were able to slip in there and, and effectively photograph it as it was at the time people were living there.
In fact, I remember it was actually dangerous walking around the hotel. There were floorboards up, there were um, bits of the uh, structure of the hotel itself which were extremely unsafe. Mm. And we got a super set of pictures and I think they had a big impact. The great strength of a story like the Spencer Hotel was it was real, it was immediate, and it was uh, very easy for anybody to see what was happening there. And uh, the more attention we could draw to that, the better. Roof and um, shelter in general played a, a great role in taking this um, story from how we found it to a ma major national audience. And um, that's, that's very important. The horrors of much single men's accommodation like the Spencer Hotel and the increasing use by councils of bed and breakfast to discharge their legal obligations to homeless people was so offensive that we mounted a huge campaign against it. It had some unexpected results. After one of the many programmes that I was involved in denouncing bed and breakfast use, I got a phone call from a man who wanted me to invest in a hotel. Shelter had the homeless people and he had a bit of money. Why couldn't we make a big profit and Shelter would get some of the cash? I think you can imagine what I said to him. But seriously, the use of bed and breakfast for families has declined here in London, although it has increased in other areas of the country. Until three months ago, the Bendelow family lived in a three-bedroomed house in the country. When their short-life tenancy ran out, they couldn't find anywhere else and they cannot afford to buy. The council accepted them as homeless and put them in one room in Aldershot until they found something better. Hi. Who is it then? Timmy. Timmy! Oh, it's Timmy. Oh, OK then. Say hi, Timmy. Uncle Timmy, do you? <laughs> Living in one room. It's not just the one room. It's like you've got other residents living in their one rooms and middle of the night seems to be the best time for everyone to be there alive and awake when you're trying to sleep. One room, two children. Um, no I feel frustrated. Simon's going through his terrible twos, so sometimes I feel as if I need my own space, and he needs his own space, so I don't tend to sort of... Well, we don't get any time on our own together, so it is sort of hard. The only sanity I get is when Peter comes home from work, that mm. I use him as a, as a board, really, to, like, get rid of my frustrations, otherwise I wouldn't know what to, what to do. Get down. Get down. Get down. Get down. Have a night time when it's lights out about seven o'clock for this pair. You've got to live in just about total darkness, but for the light of the television. Yeah, I can't actually study. I'm supposed to be studying for an open university course, which has cost me a lot of money, and I can't actually get in the hours of studying that are needed. I think it's a disgraceful way to treat people and I'm glad to say that many councils decided to stop using bed and breakfast. We had over a thousand homeless households in bed and breakfast accommodation in, um, in the spring of, of 1990. Um, in March of last year um, we reduced that to no homeless households in bed and breakfast at all. If Camden can get rid of bed and breakfast, anybody can. How did you do it? We set out by having the very clear objective that we were determined not just to reduce the number of, of homeless families in bed and breakfast, but to get rid of bed and breakfast and believed it was possible. I mean, also, being honest, it was costing the council a huge amount of money, wasted money. I mean, it was the equivalent in 1990 to £100 on the poll tax that was being spent keeping homeless families in bed and breakfast. We, we've cut that budget from £40 million a year to £4 million a year on temporary accommodation, and we're getting better value, better managed, proper homes for people. I have wished many times that shelter didn't have to exist. But having said that, I'm glad that we've been effective, particularly in combating obscenities like bed and breakfast. But we haven't solved the problem. We're just using better temporary accommodation. We still need to build a lot more homes. But as I look back, it's only one of the battles I've fought with that lot over there. I've spent more hours than I care to remember. 
trying to convince our politicians that we really need a fundamental rethink of our housing policy. And I suppose looking back, I would say shelter has really stopped them doing some of the really daft things they were going to do. I've had to deal with no less than eight housing ministers over the years. Busy Mr Baker passed a lot of legislation and saw 108,000 households become homeless. By now they were passing laws almost as fast as homeless families were ending up in bed and breakfast. A housing act at last, but this one was for landlords. Nothing here for the rising number of homeless. The first of two Michaels in consecutive years with initiatives to help with homelessness. It hit a new record high. More stopgap initiatives, an even vaguer policy, and yet more homeless. Another fresh face, but the same depressing failure to solve the problems. Another year, another irrelevant piece of legislation, another appalling statistic. Still there, still failing to find real solutions to real problems. And for a grand finale, a complete shambles. None of these initiatives added up to very much, but this year, the government launched an attack on the only bit of legislation that stands between homeless families and being on the street. The Housing Minister, Sir George Young, said there would be a wide-ranging review of housing legislation aimed at preventing people from taking shortcuts on the waiting list. Many Conservatives are now challenging the way the homelessness legislation is working. And we now have to ask ourselves whether the signals sent out by that legislation sit comfortably with the values that we all share, with the self-reliant society we want to promote. We have to ask whether it represents the fairest way of allocating housing. I believe it fails those tests. Well, we stopped them. They've backed off bringing in any new legislation. We have a new housing minister now, David Curry. He hasn't done anything yet, so I asked him onto the programme to talk about his plans. I'm afraid he declined. Perhaps he has nothing to say. I've done my best, and it's now time to hand over to somebody else. But I'd like to say one thing before I go. Most of the people that come through Shelter's door the first thing they say is, I never thought it was going to happen to me. Oh, yes, it could. So let's see if we can all make sure it doesn't happen to anyone. Since this film was made, Chris Holmes, Director of Housing for the London Borough of Camden, has been appointed as the new Director of Shelter. I wish him every success. If you'd like a fact sheet about the homeless, please write to Open Space, PO Box 4045, London W1206SE. Please enclose a large stamped arrest envelope marked Homeless. And Open Space will be back on January the 14th with a special programme about the need for a Holocaust museum in Britain.